Great. Yeah. So next speaker is uh, Ambush Kaposhi, who's going to talk about uh, uh, higher observational type theory. Yeah, thank uh, Should I use that? Or? Yeah. OK, I, I'll just stay here. Uh, yeah. So this is joint work with uh, Torsten Altenke and Mike Schulman. And you can notice there's this nice joke that um, higher observational type theory abbreviates to HOTT, right? Uh, <laughs> This, uh, this joke was invented by Mike. OK, so um, uh, how is the identity type defined? We have some options. So in ordinary type theory, the identity type is defined inductively using this constructor raffle, reflexivity. Then there's cubical type theory, where the identity type is the, where we have this uh, type interval, and then the identity is. Uh, of uh, a0 and a1. It's a function from the interval to a. And we know that if we apply this func function to 0, then we get the left-hand side. And if we apply it to 1, then it's the right-hand side. So these are these, these should hold as definitional equalities. And, uh, and uh, this interval is representing the, the, the geometric interval. So basically, we add the ge geometry into type theory. We build in geometry in the type theory to, um, to, to get the identity type. And then there's observational type theory. So here, the idea is that uh, for each different type or type former, you define uh, uh, what uh, its uh, identity type is separately. So for example, if we ha have a product, and two elements of the product A0, B0, and A1, B1, then its identity type computes to, so uh, to an identity type of the first components and uh, identity type of the second component. So the identity type of a product type is a product type. Similarly, we can uh, define the identity type of function space as uh, saying that for any input, the the outputs of the functions uh, are identical. So again, this is kind of a recursive definition. You have the A and B, and uh, you, you define its identity type in terms of IDA and IDB. Here, we didn't even use IDA. And then for Booleans, you, you can just decide uh, the um, yeah, identity type, and uh, you use the eliminator. And then if you are brave enough, you can say that the identity type of the universe, it should be equivalences, right? So that's the, that's the idea. And uh, so it's, this observational type theory is, is, is really nice uh, from a, a pedagogical or philosophical point of view that you don't have to build in uh, uh, interval. Everything is just explained. It's, it's a very simple idea. But uh, yeah, and, and, and there was lots of previous work on observational type theory, uh, and it, it works in the um, proof irrelevant setting. So when you make the identity type uh, uh, proposition, then it's fine. Uh, yeah. So, but when you want to, OK, so it also works very nicely for simple types. But then if you go to dependent types, there is this problem in, in, in defining the identity type of sigma. Right, so it should be the same. It should be working similarly to defining the identity type of products, right? So you just say that this should be a sigma type. You have an identity type of A, but then the issue is that when you want to use the, define the identity of B, the B zero and B one have different types, right? So you can, but but you know we know that uh, the first types are equal, so we can just maybe transport this. B0, and then we get something in B of A1. Or we can also transport the other way. So this is some kind of non-canonical choice. But you can make this choice and, and, and try to define a type theory on one of these. But, uh, but, but it's very unnatural to make, uh, make uh, asymmetric, or to introduce some asymmetry into your type theory. And it's also not really nice to have uh, to, to, to make the definition of identity type depend on transport. So maybe you want to separate these two aspects. And uh, so there's the uh, old observational type theory paper, which used this John Major equality, which is incompatible with univalence because it's proof irrelevant. 
And there's also something which is very similar and has the same shape of the identity types that we, we, we saw is this uh, parametricity for dependent types. So it's a parametricity translation and that's, that's what we can use to, um, but that's, that's something you could use to inspire the definition of identity type. So this is a model construction or in other words a syntactic translation which goes from the syntax of type theory to the syntax of type theory. This is what it, some parts of it look like. So uh, if we have a, a gamma context, then uh, this translation uh, computes as a relation on, uh, on elements of this context. So this can be expressed in multiple different ways, but now for simplicity I just say that I have a type and then I have uh, two copies of the context. In the, in the, this is the context in which this type lives. Okay, then if we have a, an, a type A, then the relation for this type A will be a heterogeneous relation. So this gives us a notion of a heterogeneous um, uh, identity type, or we, we'll, we'll solve this issue with uh, the sigma type, and here is the solution. So, um, so AR depends on, the relation for A depends on two copies of gamma, and the witness that the two copies are related, and then two copies of A, which can be of different type. They are uh, depending on either gamma zero or gamma one. And then for every term, this is usually called the fundamental theorem of the logical relation. For every term, we get that if the, uh, the contexts are related, if we have two copies of the context which are related, then we get a witness of the, this, um, um, this relation for A, uh, at the two different uh, evaluations of A1 at gamma zero and one at gamma one, okay? And now we can compute uh, the relation for uh, sigma types or the relation for context extension just using sigma type where we use the, for the first component we just use the homogeneous relation for context and for the second component we use the heterogeneous relation. And uh, so this is a, so this is an operation that you can define on the syntax of type theory, or in fact, for any model you can define, a, uh, this gives you a displayed model over it. So it's a, also a model construction. And, uh, and this gives uh, external parametricity. So for example, um, uh, you know, we, we have known parametric models of type theory, so it's not possible to prove inside type theory that uh, uh, the only uh, witness of this type is the identity function, but externally we can prove this using this translation. But we can use this, we can also just say that this translation gives us new rules for the syntax. So for every context we have this gamma r and that's a, that's a new um, like uh, type formation rule. And that's what we tried to do before. So I gave a talk at types 2015 in Tallinn about this and uh, when we try to define identity type using directly like that. So that's this, this, this parametricity translation prescribes how we do identity type. But then the issue is that it's only external parametricity, so we want to internalize it. So we try to add this reflexivity operation, which, which does the internalization for us, but then we ended up in some kind of hell where we didn't know how to compute with this reflexivity. So then came, last year, then came Mike Schulman and solved the problem. So let me show you the solution to this. So the idea is that external parametricity translation, it, it, um, it, it is a translation, so it computes external parametricity, but what does it tell you about internal parametricity? So it can specify internal parametricity. So, and the internal parametricity is a, it's a, it's a non-conservative extension of type theory, so it's, it's okay that you, you, you cannot, translate, get, cannot get it from a translation. And the point is that it's, a, it's another pun that it's external internal, so you just need to change your viewpoint from external to internal, okay? So you just need to uh, do the parametric, Bernard is parametricity translation, but not externally, but internally. So what does this mean? So uh, uh, if you have the syntax of type theory, we, you have a syntactic category of context and substitutions. Oh, am I, how am I doing with time? Very badly. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, um, Okay, so in, in, in the, in the pre-sheaf model over, or the, over the syntax, you, get, uh, you, get, you have access to types and terms of the syntax and type formers of the syntax. This type 
tie circle, TM circle, sigma circle. This is sometimes called two-level type theory, sometimes higher order abstract syntax or logical framework. It's the same idea. Okay, and now in this, uh, this uh, pre-shift setting, in this internal language of this pre-shift setting, you can, uh, you have a, a model of type theory, a CWF with extra structure, which is just the usual standard model or set model or type model. So contexts are just types, types are dependent types and so on. And uh, here is the parametricity translation, same as the previous slide. And what you need to do is just uh, interpret all of this in this internal model. So what I will do, I just replace con by the definition of con here, okay? So con will be replaced by tie circle, type will, type will be replaced by the, the types in the standard model and so on. So that's, uh, I just did this find and replace. And then I do another find and replace to get some uh, a nicer syntax, so I will call the gamma R, R the identity of gamma, I will call A, R the identity of A, and so on. So I have, I get uh, these uh, four operations and I get equations like this, uh, which tell me how to compute the identity type. So, and this solves also the reflexivity issue that I had before, because it turns out that reflexivity is just a special case of this up D you know, this uh, or, or subs, the dependent version of subs or the apply and pass operation. Okay, so the, the summary is that the syntax for internal parametricity is the internal version, internal formulation of the ordinary Bernardi logical relation interpre interpretation. Uh, okay, and here are some qualifiers to this. Okay, so this is a work in progress and especially to get uh, uh, real higher observational type theory, parametricity is not enough. You want uh, transport as well, and if you have transport, you also need symmetry, so the picture is a bit more subtle, but it seems to work, and uh, Mike gave a talk about uh, this, uh, a, three, a series of talks about this where you can hear more about this stuff. Yeah, okay, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So I have a pretty uh, naive question. Uh, obviously, you compare this to uh, cubicle type theory, uh, but what is the advantage or uh, what is the reason why uh, we would want to uh, use higher observational type theory instead of ordinary uh, vanilla hot, I mean? Uh, uh, I'm sure the answer is pretty obvious, but does it have to do with uh, uh, how computation works better or something like that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So mm -hmm. vanilla hot doesn't have canonicity, so you, okay. you don't know if you have a term of type Boolean in the empty context, you don't know that it's definitionally true or false. While in this theory, we expect that we have this property, yeah. Okay. Also in cubical type theory, we have this. So this is uh, to be compared with cubical type theory in terms of uh, the, the property, the computational property it offers. Yeah, it should be the same as uh, computational property should be the same. We expect that they are the same as for cubical type theory. Okay, thank you. I'll have to pick. Um, you mentioned that you would end up in permutation hell uh, if you read the, the three, or at least paper one and paper three in, in the PhD by Guillaume Moulin. You see that in, in paper one they also end up in permutation hell, and in paper three the, the solution is to use like variables to, to like, uh, how, how do you say, to, to leave this to the substitution calculus of the, of the system. So I was wondering if, if there is a parallel here or, or if you did something else. Yeah, yeah. so Guillaume Moulin, he, 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 he really fought through the permutation hell and he he like conquered it or killed the dragon in the permutation hell. And uh, yeah, yeah, but it's, it's really difficult. And uh, so the point is that his old syntax and also his new syntax is like mentions arbitrary dimensions. So you, it's like a higher dimensional syntax. While this is a lower dimensional syntax and that's the nice feature of it. And uh, you don't have to talk about uh, permutations when you define the syntax. So that's, that's a, a really nice feature, I think. But, and, and the, the idea is this, this 
internalization of the parametricity to the translation, which in, in hindsight, it's a very simple idea. So. But, but is it there in, in some form? Or, or is the problem just vanished somehow? Is I mean, I would imagine I, that... I think this is some... Okay, I don't, I don't know. I, maybe this is a clever trick which makes you avoid that. Okay, one, one more precise answer is that uh, he, uh, to prove normalization for this theory, you will need to talk about arbitrary higher permutations. But just to specify the syntax, you don't. That's, that's what we expect. Okay, so let's uh, thank Sam Bruch again.